So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and thank you to everyone who is joining us today from around the globe. Um, my name is Noelle Hutton, and I am an organizer with Community Alliance for Global Justice. And before I give you an overview for what's in store this next hour and a half, we want to center our conversation ahead in the realities of this critical time in which we are living, the weight of which is felt for some much more than others. We are called together here during a time of immeasurable suffering. And while for some, a so-called normal feels as if it's around the corner, the end of this tunnel is a long way away for many. More than 130 countries currently have no access to COVID vaccines, nor the ability to make plans to vaccinate their populations. The entire African bloc has said to the World Trade Organization that they don't want intellectual property rights over vaccines. Yet the US, the EU, and the Gates Foundation supported COVAX initiative are insistent on protecting private pharmaceutical profits amidst this global pandemic. Forgetting that no one is safe until we are all safe. Much of what we will be highlighting today in the arena of agriculture and climate is also playing out in the fight for vaccine equity. Even more, the upcoming United Nations Food Systems Summit set to be held this fall is another massive push for corporate capture. All of this is coming at a time when civil society is stretched so thin. It is exhausting and it is hard to focus on climate, but these struggles do not exist in isolation and our movements are interwoven and interdependent. Today, I am joining you all from Tetsuge Owinge, the narrow place of cottonwood trees just north of Ogopoge, also known as Santa Fe, New Mexico, the ancestral and continued homelands of Tewa peoples. This region is a unique point on Turtle Island, a fluid conjunction where many nations have come together and where native communities have always protected what has rightly come to be known as the land of enchantment. So let us all ground ourselves wherever we may be to the lands and waters among which we are fortunate enough to be held in this moment. And to the indigenous communities around the world who comprise 6% of the world's population while caring for some 80% of the world's biodiversity, who since time immemorial through deep listening to our mother earth have continued to remember how to live in alignment with this place we all call home. Today, we hope to remember also to listen to the countless frontline communities who are fighting for change, whose transformation for environmental justice comes not from some miraculous technological innovation, but a return to deeper ways of being and knowing in this world that seek to break this cycle of extraction and cultivate a just transition towards regeneration and reciprocity with our fellow human and more than human relatives. May we also ground ourselves in the labor of the oppressed upon whose backs this world has been built, including the pillaging of the earth that by some chance allowed us to meet one another today, wherever we may be through this digital lens. May we be grateful for the energy that made all of this so and use what we have been gifted in a good way to imagine a world new. And so now I will pass it off to CAGJ's director, the lovely Heather Day, who will give an overview of our Gates Foundation campaign. We will then be joined by our incredible panelists who have so graciously taken time out of their busy schedules to join us all today after which we will have a discussion moderated by our amazing AgriWatch member, Matt Canfield. And we welcome your questions and comments in the chat throughout, and we will try to integrate your remarks should we have time. And that's it, over to you, Heather. Thank you so much, Noelle. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, Community Alliance for Global Justice was founded in the aftermath of the 1999 protests against the World Trade Organization here in Seattle. We're a Seattle-based or membership organization um, with members around the world. And this year we turned 20 years old. 
And in 2008, we founded Agri Watch, our campaign to hold the Gates Foundation accountable for their agricultural development work promoting a so-called green revolution. And this past year, we we're excited to publish these two reports, which we encourage you to find on our website. The Messengers of Gates agenda focuses on how the Cornell Alliance for Science trains African fellows to create propaganda supporting the Gates Foundation's programs. And the man behind the curtain describes the Gates Foundation support for the appointment of Agnes Kalabata to chair the UN Food Systems Summit. When AgriWatch learned that Bill Gates was publishing a book on climate, we immediately knew that we needed to organize this event. Gates, the third richest man on earth whose wealth has increased $20 billion since the onset of the pandemic last year, has a huge platform for getting his ideas out there. And here you can see some of the hosts um, and event locations just for the first two weeks of his book launch. Um, his book launch comes on the heels of the revelation that Bill and Melinda Gates are now the largest private farmland owners in the United States. And it seems that he is everywhere. But the food sovereignty movement um, that he seeks to overmine is also everywhere. And today we're very proud to feature four leaders who I'll introduce in a moment and who will help us make sense of the problems with the technology-centered solutions that Gates proposes. While we appreciate Gates using his platform to add urgency to addressing climate change, we had several concerns even before the book was published um, that persist having read the book this past week. Given the unparalleled role of, the Gate, of Gates and his foundation in championing industrial agriculture, a major contributor to climate change around the world, it is quite ironic and indeed deeply problematic to see him become a spokesperson for climate solutions. Agri Watch, um, the campaign of CAJJ, was formed in an effort to hold the foundation accountable. However, it is nearly impossible and we see the foundation wielding power undemocratically in a range of sectors from education to public health. We know that climate chaos and food systems are deeply intertwined and that agriculture plays a major role in driving the climate crisis as the Oakland Institute has documented as well as many others. According to a 2019 report by the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, globally food systems contribute at least one third of human caused greenhouse gas emissions. The green revolution that Gates has funded through AGRA as well as several other institutions is centered on technology-based approaches that promote hybrid or genetically modified seeds. And these are used in capital intensive, large scale agriculture with a prominent role for pesticides and chemical fertilizers. This model of agriculture tends to intensify the use of fossil fuels and chemical inputs and in monocrops, thereby increasing the carbon emissions and environmental degradation, while also increasing the vulnerability of our food supply to climactic shocks. Meanwhile, food sovereignty and the practice of agroecology offer important climate solutions, which we'll hear more about today. Agroecology, for those who may be unfamiliar, is a science movement and practice. Um, it's based on applying ecological concepts and principles to optimize interactions between plants, animals, and humans in the environment while very importantly, taking into consideration the social aspects that need to be addressed for a sustainable and fair food system. The Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa has many, many excellent resources and case studies available on their website about how agroecology mitigates and adapts putting carbon back into the soil and provides innovative ecological solutions to meet the climate challenges. So there are three primary reasons why we're skeptical of Gates and opposed to the models he promotes. First, while Gates is able to muster enormous public and private support, the solutions he promotes actually often fail. And a glaring example is demonstrated by um, the False Promises Report just published recently, which documents the dramatic negative effects of the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa on small scale food producers in the 13 countries he, this initiative focuses on. Agra's promise to double the agricultural yields and incomes of 30 million small-scale food producer households by 2020. Um, and instead of having hunger, the situation in the 13 focused countries has worsened since Agra was launched. The number of people going hungry has increased by 30% during the Agra years. And I encourage you to check out the report to understand better the failures um, of Agra. 
Second, the solutions that Gates and his foundation promote often exacerbate inequality. We've seen this with the impact of industrial agriculture on Africa's small scale farmers and other food producers. Right now, we're also seeing this in the COVID vaccine space where there's a battle brewing over intellectual property rights versus equitable distribution. The Gates Foundation has been at the center of the global COVID response through developing vaccines and have championed an approach that promotes proprietary intellectual property rights, even though they are opposed by much of the world's poorest and these innovations are also the product of public investment. Additionally, Gates promotes an approach to global problems that simply reproduces global hierarchies of power. It's centered largely on expanding opportunities for multinational corporations in the private sphere. For example, in his book, he says that, quote, lowering the green premiums that the world pays is not charity. Countries like the US shouldn't see investing in clean energy research and development as just a favor to the rest of the world. They should also see it as an opportunity to make scientific breakthroughs that will give birth to new industries composed of new major companies. In other words, he seeks to make these global problems business opportunities by using public investment in the global north to limit the risk of global corporations. Yet across all of these cases, we see that the poor and marginalized remain so. As Silvio Ribeiro, one of our um, speakers today and her co-author wrote, like many billionaires, Gates has a blind spot when it comes to questioning the logic of capitalism. Nearly every solution Gates proposes for the climate centers on innovation by entrepreneurs driven by the promises of profits. The third reason we're skeptical of Gates' proposed solutions to the climate crisis is that he and the foundation have been working towards fundamental transformations in governance that are undemocratic. He is pushing policies that are closing democratic spaces such as the United Nations. This is very apparent with the push right now towards the United Nations Food Systems Summit scheduled to take place this September in New York. Ever since, ever since the president of AGRA, Agnes Kalabata, was appointed as a leader of the summit, it has been apparent that the organizers are seeking to rewrite the narrative on global food. This is clearly a backlash to the fact that the Committee on World Food Security at the United Nations has been a space where the global food sovereignty movement has had considerable momentum in recent years. Which is why over 500 organizations demanded that Kalabata be revoked and why many civil society organizations are refusing to participate in the summit. So we believe we must signal an alarm about Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation's ever expanding influence in policy arenas. And we're really grateful to our many partners around the world with whom we're collaborating on this very issue. And we're grateful to all of you um, for having joined us today to learn more from our speakers. So it's now my honor and pleasure to introduce them. I'm gonna do that in the opposite order um, that they'll speak. So first of all, Milian Belay is coordinator of Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. And as an Alliance of Alliances, AFSA is building the largest social movement in Africa with 40 member networks active in 50 countries whose members reach over 200 million people. And CEGJ and Augur Watch are very proud to be a member of AFSA. Milian is a founder and former director of Melka Ethiopia, an indigenous NGO working on issues of agroecology, intergenerational learning, advocacy, and livelihood improvements of indigenous peoples. Silvia Ribeiro is the Latin American director for ETC Group, which monitors the impact of emerging technologies and corporate strategies on biodiversity, agriculture, and human rights. She's based in Mexico and speaks and writes about transgenic and other new technologies, corporate concentration, intellectual property, and the rights of indigenous peoples and farmers. Recently, Sylvia co-authored a brilliant article entitled The Sugar Daddy of Geoengineering, Bill Gates' Fossil Fuel Interests and Funding for, climate, for Global Climate Engineering. Tom Goldtooth is executive director of Indigenous Environmental Network, which is an alliance founded in 1990 of indigenous peoples whose shared mission is to protect the sacredness of Earth Mother from contamination and exploitation by respecting and adhering to indigenous knowledge and natural law. Tom is an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation and acts as a policy advisor to indigenous communities throughout the US and globally on environmental protection and more recently also on climate policy focusing on mitigation, adaptation, and concerns of false solutions. Jill Mangalaman is executive director of Got Green. They were born and raised in Seattle and have led Got Green since 2014. 
got Greenbelt's community power by waging visionary campaigns at the intersection of racial, economic, gender, and climate justice. Got Green's climate justice organizing draws the links between gentrification, displacement, and community power, advocating for fair housing, dignified work, public transit, and healthy food. And both Got Green and Indigenous Environmental Network are members of Climate Justice Alliance. So with that, I wanna welcome Jill and um, then next we'll hear from Tom. Thank you so much for being with us, Jill. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jill Mangaliman. Uh, I'm here in Seattle, Washington, also known as um, the, land, the territories of the Duwamish. Um, we recognize their sovereignty over this land um, and support uh, their fight to, for uh, their, their rightful, um, uh, yeah, rightful rights to, to this area in the Coast Salish Sea. Um, and even though Got Green is a uh, local urban environmental justice organization, we are in solidarity with um, other communities uh, around the country as well as the world. Um, we see this as a the the need for solidarity, international solidarity, very important um, as our our actions and impacts here in the U.S. here in Seattle have ripple effects um, on other communities, um, and so it's not just enough to care about what's happening in our backyard, but with our, our neighbors um, in other countries and, and other uh, um, friends who are fighting um, for justice. So um, shout out to the Indian farmers uh, on strike. Um, shout out to the Lumad in the Philippines who are defending their ancestral lands from mining companies. Um, I want to uh, really just dig into what um, why how we view food as connected to climate, um, it's been a it's been a journey at Got Green. Um, we were really focused on on you know in the early days around green training, green jobs um, because we we saw the in connection between poverty and climate change, right? Like the people who are poorest uh, or have let who are unemployed will probably have the most um, uh, challenges with um, with climate change and. Through time, um, we actually started to learn deeper uh, about the impacts of climate, um, as well as the impacts in our community. And myself included, uh, thought that climate change was something that wasn't going to happen to us, or was something like far away. Um, but it's actually happening right now um, in other countries, and even here in in the Northwest, we're experiencing. Um, effects of climate change from wildfires, the wildfires to extreme weather events. Um, um, and now we see a pandemic and, and a crisis. Um, but I'll share in in 2012, we, uh, we did a community based research, uh, we wanted to learn from our neighbors, um, what are their priorities? Uh, what are they facing? And how do they define the green economy? not um, what, how the UN defines the green economy, but what is the economy that you wanna see? Um, this project uh, focused with women of color and, and um, low-income women, uh, immigrant women in South Seattle. Um, and this was the basis of our food access work. And what we heard was that, um, you know, majority of the people uh, identified the food access, access to healthy foods uh, as a main priority, the concern of uh, not being able to feed their families, not having healthy food in their neighborhoods, uh, not being able to afford it was their number one challenge as well as geography. Um, and from that, we, we decided to form um, local campaigns around it, um, and including um, forming a leadership team. And, and in this, we started to learn that, yeah, with climate change, access to healthy foods will even become more, um, more out of reach uh, for our communities who already are experiencing food deserts or um, lack of affordability of food in their communities. Um, and this really uh, launched a campaign around um, fresh bucks. And, and this was a, uh, a campaign to ensure that, um, uh, that low income families or people who are identified in the food security gap could access local healthy foods um, from local farmers. Um, and so the impetus wasn't around making profit but really how do we um, get healthy foods into the hands of, of community members in, in South Seattle? Um, and we were able to win this program um, and, 
and see uh, see our own community members be able to connect with farmers markets, local farmers, um, food that was uh, organic and affordable, um, because we know that uh, the rising cost of food is an issue that people uh, identified. Um, and to this day, that program has been, um, you know, expanded in other cities, uh, other states, as, as well as been um, a uh, uh, kind of like a program that, um, that uh, has been since also shifted into emergency food vouchers for in the time of the pandemic. And so in the last year, food access has also become even more um, a concern. Um, as we know, like with crisis, people really like, again, that is like one of their basic priorities is how am I going to feed my family? Um, and with climate change and you know, that is the ultimate crisis. If, if the pandemic has taught us anything that um, we're not ready to take care of our people. Um, and so we need more programs that are at the ready to, um, to support uh, people um, in times of, of crisis uh, and not just in crisis, but their day-to-day -day needs. Um, and we also found ourselves too at Got Green having to support uh, the distribution of fresh bucks, unfortunately. Um, you know, uh, government isn't very good at um, having relationship with community. And so um, making sure folks uh, even learn how to connect uh, to the farmers markets or where can they use their fresh bucks? How do we make sure they're in different languages? And last but not least, like in the time of the crisis, like um, how do we distribute uh, emergency uh, um, vouchers? Um, this all to say that, you know, while we're talking about like food is an emergency and we are learning that it's not enough to have food dollars that we actually need, you know, um, land and space for our communities to grow locally. Um, and, uh, you know, just knowing that the, as, as climate change worsens in other, in all around the world, you know, we really do need to be able to grow our own food lo locally in our own neighborhoods, um, you know, even right now, uh, we're, we're looking into um, how do we build up the resiliency internally in our communities um, so that, right, so that the, that um, we can't, we don't contribute further to the exploitation of um, farm workers or other uh, 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 peasant struggles around the, the world. Um, and then, so yeah, last but not least, we, we really are about community solutions. I think what really um, disturbed me about uh, Bill Gates' uh, book is that it's pro-market solutions. And, you know, we're not trying to make profits um, around this economy or this situation. Um, and, you know, it, it just really read, sent a red flag to me that, you know, Microsoft is buying up renewable energy credits and, buying up forests, it makes me think of the cap and trade issue that um, Senator and, the, uh, and Governor Inslee keep bringing up here in Washington, that we can buy our way out of this, uh, this crisis, um, that we can use smart accounting to show that we're zero, you know, zero emissions, um, but and still trying to push these market based solutions when we know the, the solutions need to happen on the ground. We know that it shouldn't be around making money, but really, how do we get people access to their basic needs and, and stop displacing them from their homes. Um, and, you know, um, I think that there's a lot to learn uh, from learning from our community members who are, um, you know, resilient and, and, and are directly impacted. Um, so yeah, I, I would just plug, uh, call Inslee, uh, call Carlisle and tell them to stop uh, pushing cap and trade, SB, um, SB 5126 is the bill number for cap and trade. There's other market-based uh, um, market types of, you know, false promises that are being proposed in Washington. Uh, you know, like they say the same thing, right? Like buy more, buy more green products or buy uh, cars, more cars. But our community members keep saying, like, we just want, you know, better transit, <laughs> or we want to be able to stay in our neighborhoods with our, our loved ones and not live far away and be stuck in traffic for so long to get to work. Um, how do we redistribute wealth um, so that 
people, there aren't very rich people like Bill Gates and everyone has what they need. Um, I think that uh, if anything, we've learned from the food access team that if you, um, you know, talk to people about what, what their issues are and you organize with them and they feel very strongly, you can see um, people feel uh, very powerful um, and, and talk directly to their legislators and tell them like, stop harming our communities. Um, I think that that is the, at the end of the day, the, the thing that we can do for climate change is to organize our neighbors and to really empower them to, to speak up and um, speak out against these corporations who are trying to make money and profit off of us and our health. Um, so I'll, I'll end it with that, um, but thank you for hearing me out. Thank you so much for being here, Jill. Got Green's work has been just so essential in our state and even you know nationally, really playing such an important leadership role. Really appreciate all that you do. So it's now my honor to welcome Tom Goldtooth. It's really a privilege to have you here with us today. We look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, thank you. The best is in Ashley. What the cook the Bashi Shichi? How me dakia pe? And better day, Chante was day a yuha na pe to use up the do. Thank you, greetings, uh, uh, all my relations. Um, I'm both uh, Dene, Navajo, and Dakota. Uh, I'm also a member of the ETC group, and uh, I have a sister that's going to be speaking after me that uh, has more of the, the, the knowledge and the technical, uh, the technical knowledge around uh, these uh, geoengineering. But uh, I wanted to, to, to be part of this uh, educational uh, session, uh, looking once again on how big money comes in with solutions. Uh, I have looked at the, the Gates book on how to avoid climate disaster. It's interesting, I got a chuckle out of that. Um, and it's promoting innovation, it uses that term. But also it, it focuses on a term that uh, he's campaigning around called green premiums, green premiums. And that triggers some old stuff with me as we're continu continuing to fight uh, an economic system that exploits the sacredness of Mother Earth, keeps on taking and taking issues of uh, ownership over nature. And it just has a lot of things with green premiums. But, but uh, the emphasis uh, that Gates is pushing is investing in technologies. And I thought that as a foundation, as I speak about this, I wanna share uh, in traditional knowledge that, uh, that we have within our Diné people, our Navajo people and our Dakota, Lakota and Nakota nations. But most indigenous uh, peoples and uh, na tribal nations that I've talked to, we have a, a common grounding on who we are and our relationship uh, to the sacredness of our grandmother earth, our mother earth and father sky, the universe, the, the cosmos, the cosmology. Uh, and I wanted to share that with you because that's the foundation that many of our indigenous peoples in the North and the global South uh, have articulated is that a lot of the uh, people, uh, the settlers from Europe somehow have lost this understanding and relationship of who they are uh, within that circle of life of, uh, of, of Mother Earth. Um, so it's a time for us to, to uh, share uh, our original instructions. Um, and uh, part of that is understanding how we relate to the universe, to the stars. And I, I really treasure this photograph uh, of the Milky Way. We have many different uh, stories, our own genesis as indigenous peoples. And, uh, and within that, on the Navajo or the Nest side, this symbolizes that relationship between 
the mother earth and the father sky. And there's many teachings that are woven into this on how that's part of the creative cycle or natural law of life itself. Um, and other different graphics that symbolize that relationship uh, with the moons and the four directions and our relationship between the land and the sky and ceremony and our relationship to the animals. Uh, many of our teachings uh, with our Dinette people is that we are the five finger clan people. We're able to use all the fingers, including the thumb. How we use the thumb is very critical. We can use it also to do damage to the earth or damage to ourselves. So there's teachings on how to maintain your balance in your life, your lejon, lejoni. Uh, so the five finger clan, we are all five finger clan. How you use this is very critical. Now in geoengineering and the techno fixes, I'm gonna just go, this, go through this real fast because uh, I'm sure Sylvia is gonna pick up on this. We call it as the objectification of nature, the objectification of that sacredness of our mother, mother earth. But in the same way, we're confronting a, a system of this world, a matrix that objectifies our woman. It's the same connection of the sacred. And these are some of the uh, uh, acronyms of some of the technologies that's woven into gates push for green premium for investment of innovative technologies. Uh, carbon capture and storage, for an example. Carbon capture use and storage, which is a recycling process of the storage of the, of the capture of uh, carbon dioxide. And, and there's so many, there's so many uh, uh, factors that actually involved in these technologies that there's no guarantee that once they capture that CO2 and uh, force it into the earth, uh, that it's gonna stay there. And uh, Sylvia will talk, I'm sure, to the contradictions of these technologies, but also the role of uh, a system of sky predators, messing with the atmosphere, the stratosphere, cloud seeding, scope X, and it, it does involve natural capital accounting, putting nature in, 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 our, in our ecosystems into an ecological services uh, uh, system, uh, financialization of nature, green economy, reduction of our ecosystems uh, to, to a commodity reality. Nature-based solutions as part of that. Carbon pricing, carbon offset, yes. But it also involves a colonial system of laws and legal system. Uh, I get a lot of this direction that uh, we, we uh, take within our indigenous environmental network from our elders. It was R Roberta Black Goat that once said when she went from Big Mountain on our Navajo reservation to the United Nations, she said, I'm here to speak for those that cannot speak for themselves. She was talking about the earth. She was talking about the medicines, the stones. And that's, a, that's what we believe in. Now, when we talk about the capturing of the carbon, the capturing of the, the emissions, the dirty emissions, this kind of symbolizes a lot about what I'm talking about. You know, they're putting it into these containers and they're investing in that but there's no guarantee that that is going to stay there, but yet they're benefiting now. Uh, our nature is not your solution. That's what we need to say to those, to that matrix out there. Uh, we need to say that to Gates and even the circle of the Biden administration, uh, which is getting a lot of influence from what Gates talking about and uh, the funding that came out of the uh, Jeff Bezos fund, the Earth Fund, actually is putting money into some of the big NGOs that are going to be pushing what we're talking about. This is our innovation back home here. This is our innovation. This is our magic right here. This is our solution. This is part of our environment, our ecosystem. This is part of 
grandmother earth and the sacredness of the water of life. We need to keep this clean. And that's, that's what they call uh, wild rice. That's what the uh, Ojibwe people call menomen. That's what our Dakota people call psi. And this is one of my relatives, my, my, my brother, and he's out there ricing and uh, using those knockers to knock the rice off the, uh, the plants, the rice plants into the canoe. And uh, this is an old photograph, but this is uh, also how the rice is brought in and it's processed in an old traditional way that does not involve any chemicals or machinery. This is, this is how we are innovative. And we have to confront a colonial legal system uh, that, 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 uh, that has a structure of dehumanizing the earth and, and nature. And uh, part of the nature objectification, the mother earth is uh, deemed as a property right, property laws and uh, sovereignty and the dominion those issues are, are couched within that colonial legal system around treating food systems, natural goods, and uh, nature as part payment for ecosystem services. So we do have solutions, food sovereignty movement that we're part of and, and speakers are part of that's gonna speak that uh, we need to be producing our own foods and that the front lines are organizing and have won many battles in shutting down dirty energy. We were effective with, uh, with shutting down the key X, XL pipeline, but we're still dealing with the Inbridge Line 3, yes. Uh, land justice, environmental land trusts within the urban areas as well as in rural areas, that's part of a solution that uh, allows us to rethink how we move around, how we transport ourselves in the rural, urban, but suburb areas as well, and energy democracy. Um, and there is a movement of grassroots providing direction to the policy makers on the Hill right now uh, around the need for a transition away from a fossil fuel economy, keep it in the ground campaign, including nuclear energy. And, and stop, scrap, throw out the fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, and, um, and also, you know, weaning ourselves as Americans, this is everyone, uh, from, from our addiction to consumption and waste. So those are some simple, you know, uh, solutions that we are, 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 are pushing. And uh, we have to be principled in that relationship and responsibility to that sacredness of Mother Earth and Father Sky. Uh, we're part of that sacred circle of the universe. And uh, this determines our relationship with all life to move towards a living economy, not a death economy of capitalism and exploitation. That's what uh, the Gates uh, uh, Green Premium means to us is the exploitation, business as usual, buying, uh, out uh, uh, greenwashing by the by the industry, the polluting industry, they can use these technologies to escape their commitment from reducing uh, the release of toxic emission. This is one geoengineering project that's in development in the Arctic at the top of the Earth, the Arctic Ice Project, and uh, this is something that uh, we're continuing to call out, bring attention to it. These are false solutions that uh, violate the sacredness of Mother Earth. Thank you. Hadn't heard about the Arc to Ice project. Thank you so much, Tom, for sharing all of your wisdom. You've been leading this movement for decades, so we really appreciate you being here with us today. Um, Sylvia, excited to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm really happy to be here with you, with all of you, and uh, to have heard um, Tom and Jill, and uh, of course, Million also will also be very happy to hear. And um, because uh, I think it's um, this book is significant for many symbolic reasons, more than the book in itself. But I will start uh, sharing um, 
sharing some slides. So um, I this is I, I many 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 talks I start with this just to remind us that um, who who are the people that are really feeding the majority of the world population and the majority of the world population like seventy percent more of the world population is paid by the networks of small food providers, like local food providers, peasants, small farmers, indigenous peoples, artisanal fisheries, pastoralists, urban growers, small scale hunting and gathering that in total have less than 25% of the land underwater and um, only use about 10% of the fuel, the fuel used in agriculture. And uh, you can see there just roughly more or less uh, how this is, how, who is producing what, where, so to say. Uh, and also that urban agriculture, for instance, is very important. So on, if that is the reality, that is the people feeding the majority, who is not feeding the majority of the, of the, of the world? Well, this is the agro-industrial food chain which is in a context, as I put there, of food, health, environmental, climate, deep and justice. Because the agro-industrial food chain feeds only the equivalent of 30% of the world's population, but uses 70 to 80% of the land, 80% of the agricultural water, and more than 90% of the fossil fuel in agriculture. And this is also the largest single factor that causes climate change. Uh, even if, if you take Bill Gates' book and extrapolate, you know, he, he fragments the information so you don't understand the links, but you extrapolate what it is uh, given to agriculture and put, extrapolate the transports for, you know, transporting food and agriculture and livestock all over the world or, you know, other monocultures and so, and the refrigeration, the refrigeration uh, for for supermarkets and packaging and all that. And deforestation, industrial food chain is, is the main cause of deforestation. So if you put all that together, it's about half of the climate change greenhouse causing, um, sorry, of the greenhouse gases causing climate change comes from the industrial food system. So it's also, it's also the main cause of health, the health crisis. Is, um, is this industrial food chain is behind the majority of the non-transmissible diseases, which is the main cause for death in the world today. And it's also the majority of the zoonotic diseases, like the one we have now, the pandemic, but also uh, the avian flu, the swine, swine flu, and many others. So uh, it's, also, it's also about, it's not only about the, the, the disease of the environment is also the disease of, of, of people, people and the environment. It's also one of the main causes of the global environment and collapse, like by chemical pollution of water, erosion of soil, biodiversity. And it's completely controlled by, I mean, completely. It's like in each step of the chain, you will have a, a handful of transnational corporations that dominate just that step. So it's about a few control the whole chain. So this is the context for the Gates Recipe, you know. And we, when when we read this book, I mean, it's um, I was I was amazed that he put all this together and remind us that he, that Bill Gates is promoting so many nasty da damaging technologies at the same time. Uh, for instance, the main the when he speaks on climate, he speaks throughout the book and when he gives interviews, he speaks on getting to zero. But in the book, he explains that he means net zero. Net zero is not zero. This is about you can continue increasing emissions if you can offset them, if you can compensate them with either technological or carbon markets that in most cases will just increase the causes for climate change. So among the many risky technologies that Bill Gates proposes, is for instance, nuclear energy, uh, a, a, a full set of novel riskier genetic uh, modified organisms, including for agrofuels based on synthetic bi biology microbes, uh, which will cause not, these are, you know, the agrofuels he speaks about, they are supposed to be in a tank and 
he, he pretends that this is not going to take any land, but this is about using large and, and monocultures of plantations of different things. And it's the same in a way also with all the artificial meat that is also requiring a lot of, uh, you know, inputs into that, either GM soy, maize, sugars, uh, to, to do what she, he calls artificial, he doesn't call artificial meat, but it's synthetic meat, I think he calls it, or something else. And it's also about using synthetic biology microbes and processes. So he's adding all the time new and more risks. And it's the same, for instance, with, he also proposed using uh, in these days of massive extinction that we may have heard all of us in this, at least in this call, uh, there is so many species in, in danger of extinction, but well, he's proposing to use uh, a, a new genetic modif modifying technology, which is called gene drives, that will that is directed to extinguish a species. And uh, even in the book on climate, he reminds us that um, he will not abandon this kind of this kind of technologies that he uses, he says, this is, this is really a peer drive, but he says that he is going to use this to extinguish mosquitoes, uh, so to protect from malaria. In reality, in reality, uh, the, the majority of the uses for gene drives will be in agriculture for so-called plants and crops, pests, and even for insects in agriculture. So it's part of his you know, extreme technology resides. And on climate, he also proposed manipulating the climate, not going to the causes of the problem, but manipulate the symptoms, either by removing the excess carbon dioxide or to block part of the sun rays that reaches the earth. And this is what is called geoengineering. He has been one of the pioneers uh, on geoengineering. And I wanted to mention a little bit more on this. Basically, and he mentions this, geoengineering is about manipulation. Every, every, every ecosystem and every part, you know, like Tom was speaking before me on Mother Earth and Father Sky, but also he speaks about oceans. Like everything could be engineered because he has a complete engineering mentality, which, uh, and also, you know, a profit engineering mentality. So this is what he proposes. But I wanted to highlight Sorry, I just um, want to mention one thing I said before. This about um, carbon capture and storage that he also throughout the book, he speaks about, you know, well, if there is more emissions, we will capture them and store them. This in reality is a technology that the oil industry created, which was called enhanced oil recovery. And then they renamed it to carbon capture and storage because it is about injecting carbon dioxide into depleted wells and push deep reserves. So in reality, it's a way of exploiting more oil, but they call it now carbon capture and storage because it gives the impression that they will remove carbon from the atmosphere, which is absolutely not warranted. I wanted to mention one example of this, which is uh, in the, in the book, he makes also propaganda for his own companies, you know, the companies he's invested in, in many cases with his personal, uh, with his, his personal fortune. And one of them is a company called Carbon Engineering. Carbon Engineering is a direct air capture company. These are like kind of funds, giant funds, many of them, uh, with demand a lot of energy and will use solvents to capture uh, carbon dioxide from the air. This company was funded by David Keith from Harvard. He's one of the most well-known promoters of geoengineering. And in the book, he explains that David Keith and Ken Caldera were the people that explained climate for him. <laughs> he learned about climate from geoengineers. In this company, the other investors are Chevron, Occidental Petroleum, Billiton, and Tarzan's billionaire Murray Edwards. So this is the kind of interest, you know, this kind of climate companies he's invested in. David Keith that I just mentioned is also promoting just now the, one of the first open air experiments on, you know, the technology needed to block the sun, which is called the Scopex that also Tom mentioned. It is about spraying aerosols in the stratosphere, supposedly to, you know, hinder part of the sun to reach in the earth. 
this to be to have any effect on climate it has to be deployed at large 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 scale but if they do that for instance over the arctic this is the main project they would alter rain and wind patterns in africa and asia and they will create droughts and endanger the source of food and water for two billion people they of course need to start with a small experiment and this experiment was planned in indigenous territories in arizona then in new mexico and now in this moment when we speak they are trying to make a first part of the experiment in Sami territory, in Kiruna, in Sweden. And they call this just a small experiment. They say, well, this is, you know, this is, this is nothing will happen. This is just a balloon that we will try. Like uh, 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 an, an Swedish friend said, uh, this is only the trigger, not the bomb. And the trigger cannot harm anyone, but the trigger doesn't have any, pro any, any meaning to have an experiment without the bomb. So as, as, um, as Heather was mentioning in the beginning, I would like to say that one of them, one of, we already know he's one of the richest men, the, the largest landowner in the US. We also need to think that the digital industry is projected to be one of the largest uh, demand, the, the industries that will demand more than 20% of world's energy. So, his recipe, his recipe for Technofix is not only risky, it's also aims to cause amnesia. It apparently, we don't need to question the causes of the crisis, just trust a new technology that each time is more extreme and that will solve the problem. And also the extremely concerning latent message that billionaires not only dominate markets and control technology, they can also dictate public policies and use state resources to provide the naval environments they need, including infrastructure. But as others have said and will continue explaining, there is also many real solutions. And the real solutions, that's why I started there, the main real solution, in fact, is related to our food, the way of producing the food, and there are Today, the majority of the people in, in the world is fed by these systems, these different diverse systems. So all together, not only feeds the majority of the population, also pre preventing further emissions of climate change. And could also, like Via Campesina likes to say, could also cool part of the earth by you know, restoring ecosystems and all that. There are many other re real solutions, both urban and rural based and, and, and many or most of them are based on strengthening and recuperating and creating communities, integrating cultural, racial, gender diversity for food sanity and climate justice. And here is a few of the documents that you can get at ETC Group's website that will explain more of the concept that I share here. Thank you very much. So helpful, Sylvia. Thank you so much. Really. Fantastic. Thank you so much for tracking all these complicated issues to help us better understand what's going on. Because it's really not easy to keep up with, honestly. Milian, my friend, look forward to hearing you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I think you were, uh, you personally or your spirit was looking over my shoulder when I was preparing. Because in your opening, in your excellent opening speech, you mentioned most, almost all of the <laughs> points that I wanted to mention. Anyway, I, I will repeat them. Thank you very much, Heather, you know, for the excellent work that you are doing. And thank you also for sending um, part of the book, uh, which are concerned on, uh, agro on uh, agriculture. I read them. And um, my presentation will be based on what I read. Um, and they, they've confirmed uh, my fear about, about the book, you know, he's a very powerful person. Um, and uh, whatever he says uh, would have an impact in how I, I will talk uh, about that a bit later on. And so uh, I think I would summarize it in, uh, in, in a few points. One, he fetishizes or admires Norman Borlo quite a lot, you know. Uh, Norman Borlaug is uh, credited as a, as a father of uh, um, Green Revolution. Um, he said that he produced uh, some hybrid seeds and he recommended uh, the usage of uh, um, um, uh, agrochemicals. And because of that, uh, in, in addition to the 
the usage of irrigation uh, productivity has increased and um, you know, quite uh, more than 100 millions of people uh, were, were out of poverty because of that. But the truth is, you know, recent research uh, on history, on history of agriculture in uh, India tells us that it's not normal uh, borlock seeds uh, or the, um, or his recommendation, the green evolution recommendation, you know, the increase in productivity has started from uh, 1950s. And um, it's mainly uh, because of irrigation that the productivity has increased. Actually, green revolution has uh, you know, an environmental, cultural, and a social health impact uh, in, in India. And that's, that's very well uh, documented. That's one thing. And the other thing that he fetishizes is fertilizers, you know. Uh, with his photo uh, that uh, that was taken in Tanzania, he talks about his his experiment in Tanzania, his experience. He even talked about the creators of uh, fertilizers. Um, but uh, you, you go to uh, Ethiopia you now and other African countries. You know, my, my research basically on food system was in Ethiopia, and I had a number of discussions with farmers, and they tell you that. Uh, fertilizer, artificial fertilizer, actually kills the soils. Soil is dead. And they repeatedly told, told me that uh, the soil has become uh, corrupt. That's what they say. Gubo, gubo lem in Amharic, you know? It meaning, you know, if you don't give him something, he will not give you anything. So it has destroyed the soils. Uh, and it doesn't, as, as I shall say later on, it didn't even help uh, increase productivity that much. And also we know we know that nitrous uh, monoxide is, I mean, nitrous dioxide is a much more potent uh, greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And the other interesting thing that he raised, uh, he raised about is um, a meat, you know, uh, he comes, his solution are reductionists uh, because his, his knowledge in technology is based on reduction science and he, and, but what's livestock in our culture? What's the importance of livestock? Um, I know part of Ethiopia called the Bali. Their whole culture is around, around livestock. Their story, their songs, their, their spiritual experience, everything. And even the, the, the way they divided the year, their seasonality is related to, to livestock. In, uh, in uh, almost every part of, uh, of uh, Af uh, Ethiopia and a number of African countries, having a livestock in your house and, and having no livestock in your house is a difference between very poor and rich uh, to that level. So livestocks are not meat, you know, that they are part of the family of rural farmers. But uh, he considers uh, produ producing uh, um, meat on a petri dish as a, as a solution. So, so that's where the problem is. I think most of the recommendations, you know, is already tried for the last 13 years, as you said, uh, Heather, with Agra. So what is the experience with Agra? And I mean, uh, people say that he's a voracious reader, but uh, maybe he's reading, you know, what, um, what is brought to him from his own circle, you know, he's not reading outside of his circle. Otherwise you'd have read the reports of, uh, the reports of Agra um, and the assessment that some consultants did. And um, SCB has done a lot of work on Agra and quite recently also, also um, the Stasi and team. And you know, that there is also research that has come out uh, from uh, a German a number of German NGOs in an African NGOs, you know? And what does the result say? As you said, it was there in certain countries. Um, the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa is mainly funded by Gates, even though some governments chip in. Um, and there is no significant increase in productivity, uh, no significant increase in income, um, increase in malnutrition. But the most worrying aspect of that report is a de the decrease in the diversity of local crops. If you if you, if Gates is concerned about uh, the impacts of climate change on uh, on families and families in Africa, 
He should talk about resilience. He should talk about uh, diversity in growth. Resilience is diversity. Uh, we adapt to climate change through diversity, not by dis destroying our diversity. It's so critical. But Agra has reduced the, the, the diversity in the certain countries that it has operated. And that's very much worrying. And as I said, farmers are indebted and we're left with dead soils. And uh, they need uh, a lot of work to, to revive them. And one thing that worries me about uh, uh, Gates is the power that he has. And so he's a power over the narrative for the narrative of uh, climate change now. And he uh, has a power over the media. You can see then that how it, his uh, book is reported and promoted in all of the media. There is very little questioning of, uh, of, of that book, very little questioning. So uh, he's very powerful. He's very far powerful because the doors of our governments are open for him. Anytime he comes, he can, he can go to any African government and doors are open. I remember one time there was a, a Gates was invited to Ethiopia to be given an honorary uh, doctoral for his, for his service. So in, in, in that occasion, the prime minister of Ethiopia and all of the ministers, all the key people in Ethiopia were present. You see, he is such a powerful person. Um, and uh, he pushes digitization of our agriculture. Do we need digitization? That's a very much important question. But one, on one thing, Agra has succeeded, on one extremely worrying thing, which is a changing of policies and legislations. You know, that is a success of Agra in the last uh, 30, 40 years. And that's, that's the most uh, dangerous uh, kind of success because um, there was success in changing um, laws and uh, policies and legislation around seeds, around uh, fertilizer, around investment, biosafety, you know. They have succeeded in changing that and they have laid the ground for the corporatization of African agriculture and for, the, uh, for, the, for owning our life, basically. But um, I, 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 I'm so happy with what Sylvia has presented also. We have the solution. So this is, this is the slide. And, and, and these are the publications of uh, AFSA, you know? We have, uh, as you said, Heather, we have a number of publications. And our advocacy and our narrative comes out of the number of researches that we do and the number of publications that we have. One case, look at this diagram. It's a very, very powerful diagram. It's, it's a work of uh, uh, an NGO in Ethiopia called uh, uh, in, in Institute for Sustainable Development, a local and indigenous NGO. And uh, the research was done over 20 or more years on five critical crops in Ethiopia, barley, durum wheat, maize, teff, and faba bean, five critical crops. And uh, the, the experiment was started with farmers. You know, they, they are the scientists here with farmers. So uh, part of the land was left to be uh, without the application of any chemical fertilizers or, um, or compost. And this one is a blue color. The, the brown color uh, look, I mean, um, um, is, is, is part of the, farm, the farmer's land where compost was uh, applied. And green is where chemical uh, fertilizer was applied. And over, over uh, more than 20 years. At the beginning, the productivity of a chemically treated land was, was very high for two, three years. And after that, as you can see, for all of the critical crops in Ethiopia, productivity is much, much more than, than, uh, than a chemical, chemically treated uh, soils. So it is possible to produce, to increase productivity and increase diversity and uh, increase the, you know, the, the, the um, I mean, the amount of water in the soil, all that. And there was a recent research done on, uh, after the Cyclone Ida, you know, Cyclone Ida has uh, uh, impacted the life of, uh, you know, millions of people in, uh, uh, in Mozambique and in Zimbabwe. And 
and they have compared conventional lands and agroecologically treated lands, like uh, gates kind of lands and agroecologically treated lands. And this is assessment, that kind of the headline. On the biophysical, we found that agroecological systems had higher absorptive capacity of surface, surface runoff, which is very much important during cycles. Uh, and had the highest level of nitrates contained. This was tested in lab, indicating reducing leaching into river systems and providing improved fertility. Agroecological farmers had higher diversity and on observation, healthier crops as compared with conventional sized close by. Socially, found, socially, which is very critical, we found, we found that agroecological farmers it's a comparative survey, we're more inclined to engage in mutual aid and support activity post cycle on. So if we are talking about climate, adaption to climate, I think we need to talk about agroecology. Thank you very much either. Thank you very much, Milian. Excellent use of slides. Thank you. <laughs> so Matt, I pass it over to you to facilitate a our closing dialogue, and we have about 20 minutes. Thank you. One, wonderful. Well, thank you so much to our speakers, and they, you gave us all so much to think about. Um, if there are questions that uh, our viewers have, please feel free to put in the, the chat, and we'll try and weave those in. But I wanted to open up by both offering you an opportunity to respond to one another, but also pick up on a theme that we saw sort of across all of your presentations was that, you know, one of the ways that, that Gates frames his interventions into climate is really by, uh, by siloing different approaches, you know, by a narrow understanding of innovation that doesn't take account the kind of holistic framework through which we kind of see these connections that uh, are so important for building a more uh, equitable and community-based approach to addressing climate change and climate justice. And so in the spirit of reweaving these connections and relations, you know, one of the questions that we want to ask you is, how can we strengthen connections between food sovereignty movements and the climate justice movements? Um, and uh, and how can we re how can we connect movements across the various uh, sectors in which Gates is working? You know, from public health to uh, climate to food to really build a movement to challenge the power of Bill Gates in uh, in in promoting his his techno driven vision. So. I'll open that up for our speakers um, and you know whoever would like to start off with some response. Um, yeah, for us, you know, we we start with again, what are the issues on the ground? Um, what what are people experiencing? And um, we know that food is very important to our communities, and so we don't actually start with, hey, climate change, <laughs> disasters, you know, coming. Um, not to say like people don't think about climate change, it's just really starting with what's in front of them, what they care about. Um, and, you know, and we've had so many, you know, green groups parachute into our communities telling us, right, you know, the ice, ice, you know, Arctic is melting and, or the environment, you know, like climate change is coming. And we know, like we, we're experiencing it. Um, we don't need people to tell us about it, but to start with what people are caring about. Um, but also um, just to recognize too, like as urban peoples, we have been disconnected from our food source. We, um, you know, we're working around the clock. We don't have the same um, time and energy uh, to cook as we, like our, as a culture, uh, losing our cultural foods. And so part of the work is also like, um, like Tom and the others are saying is reconnecting to our, our traditional practices and, and cultures and really um, you know reconnecting our relationship to land um, and and our and our traditions um, something where we've been doing is um, cooking demos like teaching folks again how to cook the joy of cooking and and even doing um, work party days with um, um, with our friends over at uh, c2c the community community or um, taking folks to the urban farm just so that they can see what's possible. Um, because here in an urban setting, we're, you know, we, again, we're disconnected from, we're at the end of the line, right? We, we go to a grocery store, we buy our food, but where does our food come from? Um, how, how are we involved with the production and the process? Um, we've been um, 
taken that's been taken away from us and so i think that's something that we're we're trying to strengthen as urban peoples like how do we how do we reconnect um and see all of this uh, see ourselves in all of this in our role um and through that um we can fight harder you know and and for for mother earth for the earth in a deeper way than just like oh you know like the sky is falling which isn't isn't going to keep people um you know uh uh, fighting in a way that is meaningful. Um, in, in fact, it may encourage burnout, right? If it's not also for our liberation. So I think that's something that um, as organizers, we should think about how do we connect to people and relate it um, to um, what's going on in their lives. Tom, Sylvia, Lillian, do I, any of you want to yeah. respond? Yeah, I don't have much to uh, add to that, but um, you know, in in our work with the Indigenous Environmental Network, we started to uh, take part in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1998, um, and. It was interesting at that time because we found that most of the NGOs and those coming from the United States as well as NGOs globally, and uh, uh, they, they operate in silos. Uh, it was interesting back then when we brought our articulation as uh, different tribes of Canada, Alaska, and US to the climate meeting uh, we included our analysis of the effects of global warming, a changing climate, climate change on, on the ecosystem, on the habitat, on our food system, because there are many tribes in North America that still go and hunt and grow uh, crops, and especially from uh, seeds that have been passed on, uh, fishing, uh, and most of the indigenous people of North America said that the changing climate and the lack of predictability in the weather uh, has affected their rights to food. So it became also uh, uh, an indigenous rights, a rights-based approach and back to compartmentalization. I mean, the NGOs that uh, were pretty active at that time and still active. Um, again, say things like, well, we never looked at how it affects the food system of your people. And we kind of look at, oh, they're pretty stupid. You know, our indigenous people say, that's not too smart of those people. But also the, the NGOs who work on human rights, we saw that there was a separation in the late 90s and early 2000s between the NGOs, environmental NGOs, conservation NGOs, and the human rights NGOs. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to report that uh, there, a, a lot of them are working together on this issue. It's a rights issue with many of our people. The other piece with the but the link between the food movement and the, the diversity of the food movement too, the global south and the north, uh, you know, we're part of also the rights of nature movement. Our network is part of that. Uh, Vandana Shiva is part of that with us. So we're lifting up the right of the seeds. The seeds have rights, especially those seeds that have been passed on by many a local community, whether it's in India, whether it's in Africa, uh, Latin America, North, North America, it's very precious, say, eh? And uh, it confronts the Gates type of thinking on the creation of climate smart seeds, climate smart agriculture, using uh, technologies, geoengineering, manipulating the genetic uh, information. And uh, it, 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 it's problematic. It's uh, disrespectful to a lot of our beliefs as indigenous peoples. That's why we're against these uh, promotions of what Gate represents, Gates represents. Check, thank you. 
my my comment on that uh, i was thinking when you ask because it's probably different in different parts of the world and for instance um i'm thinking that for most of the people in not only in mexico but in many parts of latin america where there are indigenous and peasant communities there is not such a you know, line like saying, now we are speaking about food and then we are speaking about climate or something because in a way, everything is about the defense of the territory and territory. But, but this, this is not an abstract thing, is that communities are linked to the territory and the territory is like, um, you know, it's not a piece of land, it's, it's being there as a community. And so in that sense, I don't think there is a, much difference for communities when they say about you know about defending their their territory and their right to food and you know and and climate and so on 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 that sense i then understand um yeah then what i said is different but still i think it this about this clear separation of you know working for um, environmental defense or food in different in different boxes um, is more like an NGO thing, yes. But at the at the level of communities, is is not the same. And I think that these links, some of the links that I was speaking about, that Jill did, that Tom did, million. Um, I think it is in a way it's easier because it's, it connects to your reality, you know, more directly. Uh, so. I, I don't know. I think it's important with the, the work that all of you are describing is, is important. I, 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 I pasted there, um, for instance, a new section in the Climate Justice Alliance in the US about um, geoengineering, where they made a, for me, they made a really good job on having like um, fact sheets for, for grassroots, for communities to understand different parts of geoengineering, including, for instance, how CCS, this carbon capture and storage, is coming to your community and which, and it will impact your community. Because this is, CCS is very connected to the oil industry. I didn't say, say that before. And it won't be just that they, you know, that they so-called absorb carbon dioxide and put it somewhere. No, they have to do a whole lot of infrastructure, pipelines, and, you know, make new holes is more or less like a fracking wave too. It's not fracking, it's a different technology, but it will be a lot of, you know, um, impacts directly on local communities that are in those places, but also disputes about land. And suddenly, you know, what, what they have put on the table, I, I mean, not only Bill Gates, Bill Gates is just like summarizing everything, but, is this you know new carbon metrics where you know everything is measured in carbon now and then that is what gives money what is uh, money for carbon markets or offsets or for the new bills that are being implemented in the US including in the new administration are are measured in carbon and you know, who said that carbon is more important than people's health or people's well-being? And there are a lot of other things. And, and I refer to both, you know, cities or rural areas and so. So I guess we have a lot of work to do on information and on, on, on cross-fertilizing in, cross our, you know, different kind of research and, and, um, and how do you say in English, like, you know, the things that are important for each of us in our organizations, in our communities, and how those cross each other, because we are in a new, in a new context where very few people, and Gates is one of them, has an incredible power to determine so many things, policies, investments, and all kinds of things that will affect our, our community. So, in a way, I, I personally think the work of the Climate Justice Alliance and others like probably Climate Justice in Seattle also, and so it's incredibly important just because it does that work of cross-fertilizing like urban and work, the situation for workers and the transition and all that. I think that is what is kind of the most, one of the most powerful or maybe the most powerful tool we have. 
I I would love to thank both uh, Jill and Tom for, for bringing the indigenous indigenous cosmology into this. I think that's very much central. That's very much critical. That's what which takes us deeper uh, in, in this time of change. Uh, so so thank you very much, uh, Heather. And it, it's very 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 critical. And uh, there was a question in one of uh, the chats also uh, about, about what I said, the importance of livestock in the culture of uh, Ethiopia. Yes, it's true that it's different from one community uh, to another. And they have their own special kind of relationship. And uh, livestock is very much intertwined with their cosmology. That, so that's very much important to, to understand. And I'm not sure whether Gates or the people around him have any understanding about that, to be honest with you. Maybe superficial. Um, hopefully, if somebody was asking whether we want to have a dialogue with Gates, fine. I think, but it, I don't think it is uh, possible, you know, with the layer of people that he has around him. Uh, but we're not saying, and, and don't take it as if we are against all technologies. We are, we are using technology now even to communicate, you know, to make this possible. But we have a lot, we have to ask a lot of questions because at the center of technology, there is power. So there, there is, we have to do a power analysis, you know, who benefits and who loses? And what kind of technology? Are they impactful? Are they important, you know? Do we have other much more better alternatives? We have to ask a lot of questions around each and every, Technology, otherwise we, we it's not like uh, being uh, being against technology. And uh, Gate is described as a philanthropic capitalist. Philanthropism uh, is fine, but what is philanthropic capitalism? It's bringing the all the ideas and you know all this. When you were talking about measurement, Sylvia, that's what came to my mind. You know. Philanthropic capitalists want to bring the capitalist ways of doing into, into, into philanthropy. philanthropy. That, that's, that's part of the problem. I think we can go deeply into that. And AFSA is working on justice, you know, climate justice, um, both at the regional level uh, and also at, at 12 countries. Now, 12 countries have done their analysis of their policy environment, climate policy environment, and they are campaigning now to integrate agroecology into climate policies. That's the work we are doing. And we are organizing dialogues in over 25 countries in all of these countries and uh, that this, this question of climate uh, would come. Um, so it's a center of our work. That's what I wanted to say. As you know, AFSA members, I mean, if we really uh, have the capacity of uh, reaching, um, our members have close to 200 million Africans, you know. So it's a large number, it's the biggest alliance out of the 55 African countries, we reach 50 of them. Now we are uh, creating relationship with the North African food sovereignty movement. And when that happens, then we work in all of Africa. Uh, that's what I wanted to say. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Well, we have two minutes left um, of the webinar, and um, I think I'd like to thank you. I, I want to ask if any of you have anything you want to add uh, before we close, um, and otherwise I'll pass it to Heather, if not. I want to quickly add uh, the issue of carbon farming uh, that's couched within this discussion and represents what uh, we've been calling climate capitalism. Uh, but it's part of planting pollution. And a lot of the audience needs to know that there's a link with what we're denouncing that includes uh, uh, carbon farming. Uh, your land becomes the polluter's carbon dump, you could say. Uh, it's called climate, climate smart agriculture. It uses the term of building healthy soils away from dirty soils regenerating healthy soils, soil carbon sequestration, 
carbon farming generates carbon credits or permits to pollute for the polluters. So I just want to add that in there. The big corporations are involved with this and people need to know uh, about it. And uh, Gates has actually contributed to, to the funding of carbon farming. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I think Noel is actually going to take us to our closing now, but so appreciate everybody who joined us and big thank you to our speakers. Yes. Oh my God. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming and to all our speakers for sharing your wisdom. I wish we could continue this conversation all day, but um, we don't have that kind of time, unfortunately. So we hope that all of you who joined us today will keep this conversation going. Um, if you want to follow everyone um, and continue supporting their frontline work, here are some of their handles. You can go to their websites. Um, if you want to support CAGJ, there are many ways to do that. You can become a member, follow us on our social media. Um, if you are interested in volunteering, you can email that email right there, contact us at CAGJ.org. Um, remember, we'll send out a recording of this video, so watch it again, share it with your friends, and keep doing the work. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Okay, hat. Mopada. Thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot.